So if you go online to the class website on the main page, there's now a link called the course portal. Um, if you follow that link, you have to, if it's your first time using a course portal of mine, you have to um, enter your name and red ID, and then you'll be able to see your grades and see how you compare to everyone else in the class. And I have to warn you, when you look at the grades, you see your grades on top, and then below is a list of all the grades. Um, each column is sorted independently and shows you where you stand. So there's no row that represents a particular student. So it's not like you're seeing, oh, here's, right? I mean, it's just each column is sorted independently so that it's just to show you how you, how you stand with regard to everyone else in that particular assignment or exam, and then overall. Okay, and students think, oh, you're showing my grades. Everyone else is like, well, no, that's just an accident because it's when it's sorted, so there's no way to. Okay. Um, <clears throat> There are a couple questions which um, people got wrong. Um, the biggest one was about the memento on command and undo. Um, so first of all, the question didn't ask you explain on command or explain memento. It's just what were the advantages for each pattern implementing undo, right? So some people are like, well, okay, I'll just write down all the advantages of command pattern and all and like, well, but we're asking the advantage and advantages for undo, not overall, right? Different the different question. Um, And in particular, um, if we're going to use the commands for undo, we need a list of the history, right? And then to do undo, we can then pop off the stack and, right? But if we're going to use mementos, right, for undo, we also need a history, right? If, because, which memento do we reverse first, right? And not only that, we need a mapping between the memento and which object it belongs to, right? So some people said, oh, the disadvantage of the command pattern is that we had, we need the stack. It's like, well, actually, you also need the same stack for the memento but that's actually more complicated because you need the memento and its corresponding object, right? Because the nice thing about the command is that it stores a reference to the object you're going to interact on. And a number of people said, oh, the disadvantage of command pattern is hysteresis, that is, as you do things and undo them, right, if your computation is involved, they could, the computations can drift, right? We're doing filling point numbers, they can drift. Um, most people didn't um, talk about the fact that some operations are not invertible, right? So to undo it becomes more complicated and you basically need to use a form of the mental to know what the previous state was to go back. Um, what was the other one? Object oriented recursion. Um, some people just, 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 just defined recursion as like, 
No, just having a function call itself is not object on recursion. That's regular recursion, right? Um, object recursion is, it's also not just calling a method another object, right? Um, it's just calling another method another object to get some work done to recur object on recursion, then almost everything is recursive, right? No, it's sending the same message to another object to do part of the work, right? So instead of calling yourself directly as a function with some parameter reduced, right? We're calling the same function on a different object and presumably that chain will end some point so we can call back. What else? Um, Ah, so no, um, that's a good good question. Is this related to a child method calling a parent method? No, that's something different. That's overriding the method, right, and, and just using the parent method too. So the question is, can we consider using the composite pattern um, using object recursion? Um, yeah, perhaps. Um, also, um, chain responsibility sort of acts like that. Separate job in a next class, we can do something separate. We can do that. If it's different, yeah. The chain object recursion object A is sending is getting a message foo, right? And then it sends a foo message to object B, and it sends object C, and then we. The difference, the chain responsibility is a little different because usually I mean, it stops and you're done, right? With all the recursion, usually it's, okay, I'm, I need a task to do and I'll do part of it. And then I'm going to pass, call the same method on another object to do another part, right? When you think of re regular recursion, you're calling the same function, right? And you do a little bit of work either before or after you call yourself. And then you call yourself, then you right. So there's two components. So I'm calling myself over and over again, and each call does a part of the work, right? Until we get down to some end condition, right? What about object? I understood that how an object is like passing a message to another object and then coming back. Yeah, so we want to accomplish some task, right? Um, and so object A gets message foo to do some work, okay, but I can't do the whole thing, and so I'm going to call foo on the next object, and they'll do part of the work, and they'll call foo on another object to part of the work, and that's the end of the chain, and then come back, right? Wait, it does say something about strings when we are passing from one to another, it's not coming back. Yeah, it's not coming back. So yeah. Only going to yeah. I mean, they're they're very closely related, right? The similar ideas, but. So what is an example? Um. So what's an example of object recursion? Um. Well, the example I use in class is I have a linked list, right? And. I have a special header node and a special end node, right? Um, now I want I want to create, you know, print string on it, right? Or two string on it. Um, how do I do that? Well, I call two string on the header node 
And he goes, okay, I'm going to, I'll just, I represent the empty node just to make sure there's no, I was two nodes in the list. So I don't have to worry about any case. So I can just maybe start with a parenthesis and then it passes it on to the next node and it's going to print out this value or add this value to that string and the next one, right? So each node is going to add, we're going to call two string on it and it's going to add its value to the string. And then when we get to the very end, that end node, end node is like, okay, I'm the one, I'm, or I'm just a, a null object here. So I'm at the end and so I'll add the end parenthesis, right? And so the two string method to actually do it for the linked list, we're going to, you know, call two string over and over again on each of the elements of that linked list. Yeah, 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 yeah. When I call two string, I need to return the string, right? Yeah, you could you could consider that object on recursion, yeah. Is there you are sending right? Yeah. It comes back, yeah. I'm one of the true false, I just didn't have questions. So uh, when you say internal iterators are implemented for next year, are you talking about the person who the iterator or implement the how do you implement the iterator? Yeah, yeah. And it's actually easier to make an iterator. Right, okay. Um, so here's an example, right? I, I, you know, tree, right? If I'm gonna build a regular iterator on this, what do I have to do? Well, I may first pass this node, right? But then you call next on it, right? And so I return that node. And now that iterator has to remember where it is, right? Oh, it's here. When I call next on it, where do I go? Do I go left or go right? No, because the internal doesn't have to remember where it is. So you're, doing like, doing like you're doing def for search, right? I, I mean, doing def for search is pretty straightforward, right? If you do it all at once, it's easy. You just go go there and go there, right? Um, but I stop and have to wait for the call next again. And so if I'm here, do I go there or do I go there? It depends on where I've been, right? So I have to remember where I've been somehow so I know where to go next. Because I start here and then I'm going to maybe go down here and go down here, right? But when I come back and now I go down this way. And so it's just doing that in one shot is easy, right? It's just like left, right, I mean, you do it recursively, right? It's like, okay, each node you go left and then you go you go left and then visit yourself and go right, right? Yeah. Oh so yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, have you looked up the psychological effects of the yellow paper? No. I was looking up on the internet, it caused anxiety. <laughs> one I mean it's just the internet. It's one internet article said in some string cases. <laughs> so what color would you suggest I, I it's green <laughs> right that's um, did you notice that the people's yellow paper is worse <laughs> no I did not <laughs> some of them did worse and some of them did better and I didn't no I did not gather the data <laughs> If you have suggestions for what color I should use for the final, let me know. Well, no, no. The department orders paper a year in advance. <laughs> well, there's pink, green, 
yellow, white, and I'm not sure what other colors I got. Right. <laughs> This question, a singleton is more flexible than the class operation? What does this mean? So the question is, um, a singleton is more flexible than the class operation? Well, singleton, um, the, the goal of singleton is twofold, right? Um, we want a single point of access, right? A global point of access, and we want one instance. So one way to achieve that is to make everything in the class static, right? Because in Java, at least, when you make something static, there's only one copy, and class names are globally accessible, so then I can access um, that one instance, right? So it's less flexible because it will always be static. I mean, we cannot change the modifiers. Right, right. so... Um, Making everything static, right, to achieve the effect of the singleton is less flexible. So then the singleton is more flexible, right? Please repeat it again. Well, making things static, right, um, is less flexible. You can do less with it. For example, if I have a singleton object, I can pass it around, right, as a parameter. How do you pass a class around? Oh, so I... If I've got a class, right? And say I've got, um, why not? Okay, I'll just. So I have you know, a, a field and a, a method, right? So one way to achieve the effect of singleton is just come in here and put static, static, right? And now there's only one X and there's only, and bar can access it. Um, so now the question is, which is more flexible, doing this or doing a singleton, right? I was comparing singleton class with other class, like a non-static class, yeah. maybe. But you, as you said, singleton objective is to have only one. Instance. Right. So why this is wrong? The singleton pattern formats a variable number of should be one. Yeah. 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 For that, it could be multiple instances, but one objective is only to have one instance. Do you have a copy of the textbook? No. It's in the textbook. Um, most of those issue, a true false one, I pretty much take them directly from the text and, well, not also not just a random sentence, but they have like, you know, a consequence, right? And they got the one-liner italicized. I take that 
and I either copy it verbatim or I flip it or. Design patterns to add operations to classes without changing the class. I want a visitor. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't gotten a visitor yet. Is that what you're looking for? Um, I would have counted it okay. I mean, if you said visitor. I guess I should cite myself. Right. What were you looking for? Um, so the exact one was. Visitor works. I accept the decorator. <laughs> well, but the goal of pipes is not to add operations to something that exists, it's to create a chain of operations. Yeah. I just assume it's So what is the open close principle, right? Um, the open close principle basically says that a class should be closed to modification, right? But open to extension. Um, so the singleton really doesn't do that, right? Because usually we don't, we're not talking about it, subclassing the singleton. Um, so various answers I accepted for that. Um, almost any um, pattern that basically subclasses things. So like um, the strategy, right? I can now you know, modify the behavior of a class without changing it by just using different strategy. Um, Um, but the command pattern is not adding really functionality to that object, right? Like, you want to call more Yeah, but if we're extending interfaces, there's no class that's closed. Well, when we say class is closed modification, so we can actually use a class, right? Um, but we don't use abstract classes. We don't use interfaces. Ah, but the difference is which object are we extending, right? Um, in the strategy pattern, there is the class that uses a strategy and there's a strategy hierarchy, right? We're modifying the behavior of the object that uses a strategy. And so it's that class that that's, right? It's closed for modification, but open for Extension. Not the. We're not talking about the. Okay, so we are extending the because it's not a classic. It's No. Um, again, it, it's pretty easy in the grammar. Yes. Um, and that's a problem with two false questions is the person running the exam sometimes gets to be, tr tries to be tricky. Um, 
it's yes, we can extend the grammar and it's very easy to implement the grammar. Well, that statement that sentence makes two claims, right? One is true and one is false. Mm -hmm. Is it easy to extend? Yes. That's true. That's false. That's false. There is one Which says that if the grammar is complicated, it's hard to use. Even if the grammar is complex, it adds the expression, that means it is complicated. Yeah, the grammar is complicated, you don't use a pattern. If we go with that line, answer should be true or something. But once it gets complicated, it's hard to implement. What's that? The question doesn't say it's hard to implement a complicated grammar. Right, right. I was surprised to see something that just for iteration because we're talking about that. And then I went back and looked it up. Because I thought it was momentous an iterator, but they actually. In place of an iterator? Yeah, so you use a momentum as an iterator. Uh, it's pretty simple. Yeah. Right. You don't use them to build an iterator. Instead of? How do you do that? At least that's what I that's when I went back and looked at it. Because you use the momentum to basically record the state that you normally do. So then you, you give you give so say I have a link list, I go, okay, you give a collection, give me right. the momentum where I am. Right. And you give it back to it, the next guy. Um I'll have to look at that section again, but that's not my understanding is um you create a memento of the collection and you iterate over that. Right, because the big problem is if you have well, the iterator is I've got a collection and you're in a multi thread environment, that collection could change, right? And so then, you know, what Java does is um, you, you got this complicated structure. Every any time, any method in say an array list that adds, deletes, or changes any of the oper any of the elements, you have to count how many times that's been done, right? And then you continually every time you do it, you know, next or has next or all those operations, it then checks, it has to keep track of what was that count when I got the element, when I got the started, and what's it now, if it's different than after throwing exception. It's like, it's like a snapshot cursor. Right. Copy. You get a copy and now now your people can modify this all they want, but you you don't have to worry about it here, you just go through it. All right, and that's, it's always a question of what, when you're iterating over a collection in a multi-thread environment, do you, what do you expect to happen? Do you, when they add things to it, do you expect the iterator to know about it or not, right? And the problem is if, if things are changing on you, the results are somewhat unpredictable. Any other questions? Does it violate encapsulation? Um, In Java, how would it violate the encapsulation of it? Usually, unless you're doing something tricky using reflection, all it's doing is, is calling a, a method on using an object, right? 
So no, in general, no, it does not violate encapsulation. No. They're in different order. Oh, okay. On different pages and So there is one pattern I want to talk about today because it's um, related to your assignment. And we need to talk about it. Um, I have to warn you, whenever I give an assignment that involves a visitor pattern, some students always mess it up. Or they modify the pattern. Aren't patterns supposed to be modified? but they modify it in such a way that it's no longer the visitor pattern. And so it's important to keep in mind what's essential about the visitor pattern. And what's essential about the visitor pattern is, first of all, it's, it's slightly confusing, um, and it seems like it's more work than it's worth, um, particularly in the assignment I gave you, right? Um, usually, when you use a visitor pattern, you've got a structure with lots of different types, more than two types, maybe three or four or six. Um, and then it makes more, it seems more reasonable there. Um, so if we talk about it, we'll go through that, but I'm just, I want to warn you in advance, right? So if you normally sort of doze off during class, don't do it this time, right? The next 15 minutes, then you can doze. So, um, you know, the visitor represents an operation on, right? elements for the structure and allows you to add operations without modifying the class. Well, that's not true because you have to build a class to accept the visitor. So once you've built the class to accept the visitor, then we can add more operations to it. Um, so um, simple example, have a tree node, right? Um, and now, you know, we want to print it out, right? So we want to print it out on paper. We may want to print it out on the web, right? We may want to print it out on the screen. You know, various ways we want to print it out, right? So, um, So assume we've got HTML documents, we've got PDF documents, tech documents, and who knows what else, right? Different formats, word format. Um, you know, so we could do something like this. You know, we have a print method and we pass in um, the tree and you pass in the document and then it's like, well, okay. Um, now I go through all the nodes in some order, doesn't matter what in this case, and then like, okay, what type of node is it? With an inner node, I do this, and if an outer node, I do that. But then, 
it also depends upon well, how do I print on a PDF document? How do I print right on these different types of documents? Each document is different, right? And so then we get this huge mess, right? We have, we have a case statement on the type of note it is and a case statement on the type of document. And then if we add another type of node, we add another type of document, we have to go in this huge case of case and modify all the plates, right? So far, so good. Yeah, so we can, you know, create a printer class and then I can say print tree or print leaf. Right, um, so a print tree, like I give the tree in the document and then I go through and now I check to see what type of node it is. And I then um, call the print statement for that type of node. I, I separated them into two places, right? Yes. I mean, two of them are also. Yeah, yeah, there's so many. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is better, right? Because nesting case statements is pretty complicated. So it's an improvement, but it's still not ideal because now we have a plus, we have to, you know, if we have to modify it now, we have to we still have to find all the all of them, right? Okay, this is, people are gonna try this and it's not gonna work. Um, so it's, we have to understand why it's not gonna work. Um, so you say, okay, I mean, look, well, this, in my print tree node, I'm gonna, you know, again, go through all the nodes and then this call print node, right? And then I'll have a print node for inner node and a print node for leaf node, right? And, you know, then I'll have a HTML document and PDF document, right? And it's like, okay, we've, we've broken up in separate, all the cases are separate, right? It won't work, why? What's that? Yeah, what's going to happen when I call this statement? Right. Yeah, so if you're in Java, it won't compile. Which language? I don't think it'll work in JavaScript either. Because it has to, because um, at runtime you have to figure out which either runtime or compile time you have to figure out which methods are gonna call, right? Based upon the type of the argument, not well actually you know, here the problem is current is defined to be a type node, right? And so the compiler in JavaScript is gonna be looking for a match to node, and there's there's an inner node and a leaf node, and so the, there's no best match. And so it's a compiler. JavaScript, the compiler won't care, but I don't think it can detect it at runtime. Figure it out. You can have classes in JavaScript and
I've avoided JavaScript. Yeah, I don't think it does, yeah. Um, so it doesn't work, right? These are compile errors. Um, so in Java, right, overloaded methods, which one to choose, which one to select to decide the compile time. So it's a static check. And so it looks at the declared types, not the actual types the object holds, right? So here, right, like again, you know, the compiler is going to look at current and it says it's declarative type node. Now at runtime and maybe a inner node or a leaf node, but the compiler doesn't know that. The compiler only knows the type you declare to be. And so it's looking for a match or a best match. And it can't find it. So it's a compile error. Oh, sure. So we, we create another method called private, you know, print node and declare this to be type node. And that's the one it's always going to call. Because which method, which method this calls is decided at compile time, not runtime. So it would always, if we added a, you know, print node node, that one would always be called. In Java, right, the, t the actual type of your parameters are not used to decide which method to call. Now here you have a method with two arguments or a method with three arguments, then they matter, right? But when the compiler has to know which method to call at compile time, and which method to call is decided at compile time, not at runtime. The only place in language like Java where you decide which method to call at runtime is when you send a method to an object. And then at runtime, we look at the actual object to see what method to call. So in this case, you've got a parent class method foo and a child class method foo, and I declare a variable to be type parent, and I call foo on it, we decide which foo to call at runtime based upon the actual class of the object that we're receiving. That's the only place in language like Java um, where we decide which method to call at runtime as opposed to compile time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's the key point, right? The key point is there's only one way in which we can decide a method that's called at runtime in Java, and that is by sending a message to an object. And the problem here is we want to decide which function to call based upon two things, right? The type of the document and the type of the note. And this is the key point, right? This is the key point in the visitor pattern. And you're not calling, you're just calling a function. We're just calling a function. Right. Compile time, right. So the only way to decide which function to call based upon two different types, right, is to send it twice, right? We send a message once to one object, and we can decide one of those two, and we send another object, decide the other one, right? Yeah, I mean, so we can we can do this, right? But again, we're we're just if if current is leaf node, then we can so we can check what type it is. But then again, we're 
hiding it. And if we add more types, then we have to go and modify all these. Um, yeah, that's just, you know, no, that's, again, yeah, we run, there's always ways we can try and trick the compiler and the compiler, you can't trick it, right? I mean, so the key idea in the visitor pattern is the only way we can select what method call at runtime is to send a message to an object, right? Um, and that's it, right? So in the visitor pattern, we're gonna do it twice. Once to select one, in our case, the document type, another one to select what type of node it is. Um, So in our example, right, so our node class, um, you know, I've got a print method um, and what it does is we pass in one of our printers, whether it's a PDF or, right, and then we're going to then inside this method, we're going to call a method on the printer telling it what type it is. And then um, what's going to happen is I can now basically tell the node to print that particular thing, right? Yeah, so we can there's two ways of doing this, right? Um, well, so the question is, um, why not just say print node here, and then here I'll say type of node. Um, no, no, it, it won't work, but we have to do it one place or the other, right? And it, that will work. Right. But they might be just doing that pretty soon. It seems cleaner though. Is that your question? Um, the only difference is which is more obvious to what type of node you're dealing with when you say print leaf node or you do it here, right? Um, you could. So oh, yeah, I mean, there's. Right? I guess you could, you could do both. Right, yeah. You do go one to the back end. <laughs> right, so in my nodes, right, I'm going to pass it the, the printer object. They're going to print on, right? And, but then we don't do anything here except we call the print method on the printer. So to get the job done, we're calling two messages, right? I, I first call print on the node. And then in the, inside the node, I call another method on the, the printer. That way, when I call print on the node, I'm selecting which type of node it is at runtime. That we can do. 
But if you know, it's just the arguments are the same. Now it doesn't matter who the receiver is. And then I call print leaf or print inner node on the. On the receiver is an object. Right now, now. It's, that solves the problem. Right. But again, it's slightly confusing because now I call print on the node, and the node then calls print on a document, right? So there's this bing, bing, right? And here, okay, here's a key point that to keep in mind for the assignment, right? When you do this, it's like, it's slightly confusing. I, I start here on a, on a print, and I call print over here, and then I call print over there, right? Why don't I shortcut it by just come over here and have a case statement because then I just call print once. But the whole idea of the pattern now is that it becomes easy to extend it here. Right? If I want to add another type of document, no problem, right? So I can add new types of documents or printers and not have to modify the node hierarchy of the trees at all, right? Now, if I want to add a new type of node, then I have to go and modify all my, in this case, printers, right? Because they have to know about all the different types of nodes. But at least, that's not hidden in some case statement inside of a method, right? It's all explicit. Here is all the nodes we have. Here are the, doc the printers we have. And they have to know about each type of node. So far, so good. Right now we can just, in my pre-printer, I can just give the tree and then I can go with all the nodes and right, call print on it. And then it sends the document to the, to the actual node and the node then calls back to the printer to tell me what type of node it is and play. Right, so this is what we gained, right? We, we've, we've gotten rid of the case statements through the statements. Um, we, we can add more types of documents or printers, what it called it, right? Without having to modify. And then we can do what you suggested, right? We can just, um, the documents, instead of saying, what type of node, we say print node or print, right? And then the type of node that it is. It works fine, right? Okay, now if you want to doze off, you can, right? So you've got questions about the sun design patterns if you reduce the if else statements. Right, you're right, you're right. Yeah. So now, I mean, the whole structure is designed to be for printing, right? Um, and so, the visitor pattern, we don't do it for a particular operation because it's, we do it for general, right? So then we have an accept method and we create a visitor type thing. Um, and then in your nodes, it's like, okay, you accept the visitor and then you call, you know, visit me, right? And now the visitor can do anything, right? It could be, it could print things out, it could accumulate, information I could
and the visitor, each visitor has to know about all the different types of nodes. So in our structure, we can add you know, our accept method and it then bounces it back to the visitor saying, visit me. Um, and now the visitor can do anything, right? It's, and that's why they say we can add an operation to it, the structure without having to modify the structure because now I can create a new visitor, do something different. I wanna go through all the nodes and sum up, you know, all the nodes have numbers in them. I want to create the sum of them. Okay, I can do that. I'm going to print them out somehow. I can do that. And whatever we, whatever we want. That you do not need to modify your classes. So. Yeah, so we have to modify our, in this case, our tree classes to accept the visitor, right? So there is that modification. Once we make that, then we can add more operations without modifying the tree structure. Or. We need to add the stuff. Right, right. Later on, we do not need to touch the main classes. But right. We need to touch classes. We need to create. We have to create a visitor, a visitor for each type of operation we want to do on the structure. Um. Yeah. Tree example. Um. And it's, we're dispatching twice, right? When we do this, right, we accept this visitor thing, and, you know, the accept is on some sort of node, and then that node calls a, a, a visitor operation. So we get this, this operation. Um, and the text talks about various issues, like who who does the traversal? Should the visitor do the traversal, or should the structure do it? Use an iterator. I mean, they're all possible. It just depends upon what's right for circumstance. If you do it in the structure, then there's basically only one way to go through it. Um, if you do it in the visitor, the visitor can then Traverse different ways. So if we've got a tree structure, if we put the traversal in the structure, we decide one way. It's depth first or breath first or whatever, right? Um, if you're in a visitor, then one visitor can do breath first. And then we can do depth first search, depending on what's appropriate for that visitor. Um, whoever, regardless of whoever does the traversal, they have a visitor and they're the ones that call visit. Yeah, someone has to start it up, yeah. So it's the same, it's the same interface regardless of how Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so when to use it, well, various ones, um, first of all, you need, a structure with different types of ob object in it, right? If they're all uniform, we don't need it. If they're all the same type, um, we don't need the visitor pattern. Um, and then it may be that you keep on having to add more and more operations to the structure and it be just becomes, you're continually changing it. Um, and you just want to keep that structure clean, and so we just we can use a visitor pattern. Um, and you may not be, you may not want or or have the ability to change those those classes. So once you have the visitor pattern, we can provide operations on them.
Yeah, so we can add new visitors, right? That's easy. If we add new elements to structure, it becomes hard because now we have to go back and modify all the existing visitors because you have to know about each different type of the node. Um, It's also a way of accumulating state. So uh, the visitor goes through, it can just keep account or whatever it wants, right? Um, and yeah, the, the visitor pattern interacts intimately with that structure. So there's, um, of course, that means you have to modify the structure, classes in the structure. If you can't do that, what do you do? Well, um, you know, a while back there was this popular idea called aspectorian programming, which would allow you to do that without modifying a class. Um, of course, now with language like C sharp, we can extend have extensions to classes. So we don't have to modify the exact class, we can just modify a local copy, right? Um, and well, I'll, next time I can talk about examples of when this is useful. So the visitor pattern, when you add your visitor, in theory, you don't have to modify the, one of the you know, main class, but you may need to modify it to open up fields that the need to get to. Excellent point, yes. The question is, what sort of access does a visitor need to do his job, right? And that might need to expand. That needs to expand, right, yes. Yeah. As, can you ask a question again? I didn't hear the first part, and I, I have forgotten what assignment three is because that was not today or yesterday. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, kick it. Yeah. Well, I think it was add note. I'm not. I'm not sure it's a deletion. I think that's just add note. I'm just adding a new note. And you don't have to worry about deletion. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure yet. I was wondering, like, why you you mentioned that we had to add next. I was wondering. No, just, yeah, add it. No, just just. It's not concatenation. No, you have to create the tree, right? right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's no need for a duplicate, right? Yeah. 